Hello innovators, I am Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. Today I'm talking with Matthew Belair. He's the author and coach of Zen Athlete, Worldwide Traveler, tutored by monks, and creator of the Quantum Heart and Master Mind Body Spirit courses. He has studied with Buddhist monks in Nepal, Native American elders in North America, and a 34th generation Shaolin monks in China, which I think is super cool. He is on a mission to make a world a better place. So thank you for joining me on the Polymath Polycast. Uh, thanks so much for having me, man. I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here. Hello and welcome to the Polymath Polycast. It's gonna be fun. This is a show by Poly Innovators, so please say hello to the innovators in the audience. What's going on, guys? How are you today? <laughs> it's gonna be good, and I think that uh, a lot of the philosophical aspect of this episode is gonna be really helpful for a lot of people. I actually saw your time lapse in the Himalayas, and I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, that I was thought, uh, uh, the Himalayas was a very fascinating experience, man. Very beautiful mountains. They just seem to continue to go up forever. Yeah. I wonder too, just like how it just changes your appearance or not appearance, but your mindset in general, just by traveling there, maybe climbing up them too. Yeah, absolutely. I think traveling is one of the best things you can do because you see all these different cultures, these ways of life, these values, um, perspectives, conversations. So, um, mm -hmm. I think they're all incredibly valuable. And when you trek Mount Everest, you actually have little towns up there, you know, three days up or four days up in your trek, there's actually little mini towns, which is very fascinating. And I think yeah. it was around four days up. Um, I looked across the Himalayas and there's this, um, building like, a kind of like a Tibetan looking, uh, structure. I don't know how to describe it, but there's a building over there. And I asked my guides, like, holy smokes do you guys see that like what is that and they didn't know and so it seemed like <laughs> something out of like one of those spiritual books like autobiography of a yogi or something like that but they didn't yeah. know what that temple was and it was far off into the distance and uh, so they didn't know how to get there or what it was so i thought that that was very fascinating yeah it makes me think too this like uh iron fist the, the show about the spiritual superhero he fell like out of a plane into the himalayas and then all of a sudden around that time a portal opened up to a like temple based city essentially and so just by happenstance he had fallen to the right place in the right time for this portal to open up for these monks to f go save him basically so maybe that's kind of a similar experience there <laughs> yeah it could be you know like it, it's very very weird to be seeing a huge temple you know on the side of a yeah. mountain you know w it was four days up on mount everest so even to get where i was is a pain in the butt and that's a well-known yeah. path so going up another mountain and building that structure so yeah i don't know yeah. what's going on there but i would love to have made it to that side and see who's over there and what's going on yeah well and just by happenstance too i'm looking at my two screens here i have three in, you in the middle and these other two on the side and i just i blocked off everything else so i could focus on this and i have my background which is just these giant mountains and so it's just kind of interesting how i'm seeing the mountains as we're talking about it too but uh, something I like to do to break the ice is to have you share something about yourself that no one knows about you. Share something that no one knows. Well, you know, with my podcast, I'm pretty open. I do a lot of listening <laughs> on my show. So most people, uh, you know, they have a pretty clear idea. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, I think maybe one of the less common things known now is just I'm a new father. So not everybody knows that. Nice, so, congrats. Um, you know, yeah. So that's and it, it's a weird thing having a daughter now because you don't know what to do with social media. You know what I mean? She's mm -hmm. so cute and I want to share those videos. Um, but at the same time, yeah. social media and the internet's a strange place. So you don't want to go too too far with it and you want to respect the, the, the new life. So um, that's just a weird side note. But yeah, a lot of people are like, oh, I didn't know you had a, had a baby because I, I, I post I post here and there, but nothing, nothing too crazy. So that was a big event in my life that um, people didn't really know about. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting too, because a lot of people over the years didn't really think about privacy of social media. And like maybe that particular person, your child that you have, maybe when they get older, they want to have that privacy. And if they were posted without their consent when they're a baby too, I don't know how that might, that dynamic might come out. I don't have a child, but it is interesting how there's a lot of thought going about now. How should I post these pictures of my child that I'm really excited about? Or should I just keep them for myself too? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the, the new age, right? Everything is changing so quickly. So you just try to do the best you can and um, be a positive influence. So that's kind yeah. of the one we're going through right now. So we're, we're posting here and there, but not, nothing too crazy. Well, and I think too, personally, I've always liked seeing pictures of my families or friends, kids that they might have. And so it's one of those things where I'm always happy for them. And so I wonder if it's a private feed, but moving on to some of the questions here. What was your mindset five years ago and how have you changed since then? 
Well, you know, that's a good question. And I'll also, a lot of people will ask me like when I had like a, a an awakening or when did I um, enter this path? And for me, um, I've always kind of been like this and it's been just a, a journey of the same kind of mindset. So when I was a kid, I was just curious about human potential. I love martial arts and I thought that pe people could be superhumans. So I was watching <laughs> these Shaolin monks, which I ended up training with in my life. And I would kind of study superhuman people who I think like Bruce Lee, I thought was pretty superhuman. Nowadays, you've got Wim Hof is pretty popular. But if you know, I forget his name, but some guy did a, a triathlon every single day for 30 days. Um, it's just <laughs> unbelievable around different states. Like what the human body and mind is capable of is absolutely extraordinary. And so for me, yeah. I kind of always had that way of thinking. And I didn't realize that I thought a little bit differently than my friends when everyone was going to college and university we had to do another year of high school and then do four years of university but we could go right into college if we wanted so i said you know what i'll just do two years of college because you know already if you do college you're perceived as not as intelligent right so i was like okay you know what i'm gonna do, i can't do another five years of school right so i'm gonna limit this i did two years of college um, but what was fascinating is that none of my friends were thinking about traveling, what they wanted to do with their life, what they were curious about, what they wanted to explore. And I wanted to explore the world. I wanted to explore my potential. I wanted to, you know, just explore everything. You know, my mindset, I was, I was researching consciousness in my teenage years. Mm -hmm. So doing meditation, lucid dreaming, astral projection, anything that existed, I was trying in my teenage years. And so it just continued to evolve. And so five years ago, um, I think that I started to mature a little bit because in my 20s, I wanted everything immediately. And then five years ago, I was just finishing up some of those big travels. And then it, it taught me a lot of really important lessons about my life and how things took time. So mm. one of the examples was training with the Shaolin monks. Um, you know, in if you look out there in the world and you see people like Breaking Stone and, and things like that, or they say they can do th things with their consciousness. A lot of it's actually a magic trick and I'll call it uh, black mm -hmm. magic because they're deceiving people to make you believe that they have some sort of power that they don't. And so I'd come across that in my studies of hypnosis and magic and manipulation and things like that. It's very important because there's actually more people doing that than people recognize. Um, and so when I was training with the Shaolin monks, I had to know if they could actually do this because it's unbelievable. Like what they can do is yeah. absolutely unbelievable. Humans should not be able to do that. And so one of the masters could break stone with two fingers. And so I had the chance to interview them, interview him, and they had only opened up the temple to Westerners 10 years before I'd got there or eight years or something around that. And um, usually you couldn't interview them, you know, but I was yeah. persistent. And so... I was interviewing this master and he was saying, I said, you know, the first question I asked is like, most people would think what you're doing is unbelievable. How, how do you do that? Like, they're going to think it's impossible. What's the trick that you're doing, right? Trying to see yeah. if there's a trick, right? And so there's a translator, she tells him, and he just says, no trick, comes back to me. And I say, come on, like, what's the trick? Like, do you break it a little bit or whatever? And he says, no trick again. So I ask a third time and, and uh, basically he understands what I'm saying now because I keep repeating the same question. And he starts slamming his fingers down on the desk saying years. And it was something like, I can't remember exactly the duration of time, but like eight years of hard Qigong conditioning his fingers. And then years mm -hmm. of Qigong with meditation and understanding the energy body and their understanding of the energy body and the way they map out uh, the meridians and things like that is is extraordinary. It was it was a very fascinating thing. I did a acupuncture course when I was there as a, as a bonus course, and they had maps on maps of the human body and the energetic system that was mind blowing that would take years to understand. And so, you know, when when he told me that what I realized was immediately that there's no tricks because I was always looking for the short the shortcut and trick and there are better processes for sure um, but if I dedicated my life to anything with that kind of tenacity for five or ten years I would be successful and so that's really at that age where I started to mature a little bit into that understanding so I think that would be the big switch is saying okay really think about what I want to pursue and then if I'm willing to give 10 years of my life to that then I'm on track and if I'm not, then it's not aligned enough or, or I at least got to get to that first step of, of passion and uh, meaning. 
Well, like our content, for example, you and I both are super passionate about what we're creating and we're willing to take 10 years to put it out there if we want to. It made me kept thinking about like the iron skin where they can, like people would break wood over someone's back or something like that. And I even saw a video of you and a, uh, that are students punching each other in the arms and the chest to harden up the skin. And I thought that was really interesting too, because I, I took Kung Fu for a while and we used wood. We used the, the wooden poles with the sticks coming out of them. You hook onto them. It was a mantis style training. And it was just interesting how like I could barely hit it because it just, I was so sensitive. My bones were sensitive. My muscles were sensitive. And now that I've gotten older, I would punch lockers just to train my knuckles and not, not like in an angry way or something like that, but just out of curiosity, kind of feeling how it felt. I'm like, oh, that feels kind of good. I can actually get a handle it now i can actually get stronger and it's just interesting how the more training you do the stronger you get the more muscles you have too because a lot of times people are overly skinny or maybe not uh, muscular enough and they have to build up the, the actual meat shield behind it as well it seems like yeah all of those things and and the conditioning was a very fascinating experience because my first day there i i was training at a, a professional mma gym before that and it's a very different type of training and then when i get there the first day i'm getting kicked in the back um you know as hard as possible by one of these monks because um, one of the students wasn't kicking me hard enough and i just had to stand there get kicked in the back kicked in the legs and things like that and so Part of what they're training is, though, is the spiritual body. And so that's why I love martial arts, because it's it's both sides. It's the, you know, the the spiritual, the unseen, um, you know, and that's what they're doing. They're cultivating your spirit. And even in Thailand, they call it the fighter spirit. And that's cultivated through intense training, years of like conditioning their shins and doing this insane training that pushes their bodies beyond far beyond what a normal person is is capable of. So when they're in the ring, they don't quit. And so in in China with the Shaolin monks, it was a little bit softer. It was more about the personal development of what you could create rather than combat. You know what I mean? It's more about the cultivation of mind, body, spirit um, to do things that are extraordinary. And so I even heard a story about if you if you stayed there long enough and you were one of the top students, you could go to this kind of like secretive place. And one of the students got to go there. And he said that, you know, one night he was outside and he saw one of the masters when it was snowing, just standing there doing standing Qigong. And it was and he had a ring around him. So there was the, the ring around where he was standing. There was no snow. And um, everywhere else there was snow. And I was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. And I was like, man, could be because you shouldn't be able to, you shouldn't be able to break those stones. So, you know, whatever's yeah. going on with that, like could be something else. So, and that's why I wanted to go and train with these yogis and these Shaolin monks, because I heard these stories in books and I just kind of wanted to separate fact from fiction and, and see for myself. Yeah, and I think that's a great way of going about it. It also makes me think of just quantum mechanics as well, because it seems there's a lot of science behind a lot of this energy, but there doesn't have to be. But I like the balance behind it. But speaking of balance, you have your master mind, body, and spirit show. And I just wanted to bring that up because you're talking about the trifecta, so to speak, of all these different parts of your life and of everyone's life. And so what originated the show and why are you so like idealizing these particular trifecta? Because I understand, but just for the audience's sake. Yeah, you know, I think I understand at least. The, the, the show came about because, um, you know, my whole life, I, I wasn't able to have really deep conversations with my, my friends or anyone, you know, nobody wanted to talk about these things. And then when I was in Whistler, I was a, a snowboard coach for a long time. And um, I, then I had one friend that I could chat to my best friend started to kind of like, be open to these conversations. And then maybe six years later, a, one other person. So just literally two people in my life that I could have a deep and meaningful conversation uh, to for, a, you know, more than one or 10 minutes, right? So yeah. you know, all these different topics and they were open to these ideas. And so I thought, hey guys, like, why don't we just um, like record these conversations? And one of my buddies was open to it. The other one didn't really want to. And then I was also getting mentored by Michael Lozier, who's the author of The Law of Attraction, uh, The Science of Getting, what is it? Uh, his his book I like the most because the science of getting more of what you want and less of what you don't. And I've read all, a lot of those books, most books on law of attraction, lots of esoteric books, lots of spiritual books. And the reason why I liked his is because it's uh, based on neuro linguistic programming. So you know it's very functional, it's very practical. And for those of you who don't know what neuro linguistic programming is, I definitely encourage people to check out a basics book because neuro is how you think, linguistic is um, what you what you what you say all in words but also in your head and programming are your mm -hmm. habits so you could kind of use that architecture 
and belief systems of what the best basketball player or snowboarder or skateboarder or, or entrepreneur um, does. What do they think, right? You know, what do they say to themselves? What do they say out loud? Um, what are their habits? What are their beliefs? And so you can kind of um, code that and then you can actually, you know, take on that coding and program it within yourself. And so that's why I liked his book because it was pretty practical. And a lot of the stuff in the spiritual community, especially nowadays, can be a little bit too far in the esoteric and not, not tangible. Although I, I believe it's possible you know like with dr joe dispenza's work um i did his intermediate and advanced workshop where he if, if you don't know know dr joe dispenza he's very fascinating too but essentially teaching meditation to people um, um for long periods of time to um, heal themselves of sometimes terminal illnesses and i've had many guests on my podcast who have done that and they always do it through the same same way clean food clean water decrease stress and some sort of visualization, yeah. but it has to be over time. And so, so at that time, um, I did the first episode with my friend Anders and then I was like, oh man, I'm going to, I'm going to keep this going. So I just format formatted it like an interview. And then my intention was just to interview people of like minds. And so I was, I was super grateful to interview Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. as my second interview, but it was basically my first one. And then from there, I just kept going, you know, wanting to have meaningful conversations um, of substance. And so that was a little bit before podcasting took off. And now we're at like 450 episodes and, uh, you know, yeah. exciting times. I saw just the sheer number. I was like, I've been doing this for a while. And I saw your number. And I was like, dang, I'm not even close to him. That's amazing. I love it. <laughs> and it's interesting too, because uh, I love the whole mind, body, and spirit combination. I actually I came up with this more modernized philosophy too, like kind of like what you're doing with the mind, body, spirit, and emotions called the four pillars. And all it is is just a, a modern take on like the four areas of yoga or different aspects of Greek philosophy. Just everyone it seems like across the globe has come across this idea of these major areas of life. And I found that emotions to me seem separate from the mind where they seemed a little bit more connective tissue, so to speak. And so I was wanting to see what you thought about in those four pillars, so to speak. Yeah. Well, you know, if you look at um, any ancient teaching, they are going to bring up those, those four pillars and um, you know, to bring them in a new way is always good, you know, but if you go back in history, that's why I like the mind, body, spirit, it's, it's nice and simple, but that's what I learned through martial arts. So they're all incredibly important. Like, you know, in Buddhism, they'll talk about mental nutrients. What do you feed your mind? Right. So yeah. if you go into an environment and let's say you come into my home, right. And I've got like a painting of like death on my wall and it's all dark. And then there's like another bloody weird photo and then there's weird music. And then there's like all this other death stuff around. That's like very graphic. You're going to get a weird emotion. You're going to be like, this place is weird. I don't feel good here. You know what I mean? And so, yeah. um, there, that happens in micro ways. It happens on social media, right? It happens, um, on, on how we curate our feeds on, on where we pay our attention. And so in Buddhism, they call it mental nutrients. What are you feeding your mind? It's so important. And that's going to lead into how you feel, because if you come into my house, you don't choose the feeling of being like sketched out because I've got crazy crap on the wall, right? You're just going to yeah. generate that emotion. Now with training, you can, you can stay, you know, centered. And that's what the whole point of martial arts training is, um, is to stay centered. And then obviously the body part, um, is, is important because the more you take care of your body, the better the energy system works, the better, you, uh, more clear you think, and you upgrade basically every other part of the human body and human potential. And then that's where you lead into the spiritual part and the esoteric part into, um, the unseen world. And that's what they trained with and understood in the Shaolin monks. And that's what they've understood in, in, in yoga. That's what they've understood in all of these different disciplines. Um, the mm -hmm. body is the easiest thing to break. And so that's what they basically do um, in, that, in that training is they break the body so the spirit can come in. So it goes beyond, oh, what I think I can do, right? And even David Goggins, who's who's a superhuman and just nuts, he's like, you know, when you think you're done, you're like 40% done. And what he has done is unbelievable. And so when we see these ideas, what we're really always doing is cultivating our spirit. And that's where I feel like that's that's step one, but we need to go to the step two of how does that cultivation support our community? And so that's mm -hmm. you know how I view the whole entire thing is the more we can be um, – mentally strong emotionally strong physically strong we can be um producers in our community we can be helpful we're not the ones that need to be taken care of and we're showing a, a great example of what's possible 
Yeah. And it seems like, too, the reason why I thought about them as pillars is that pillars can be built up and they can crumble. And if you neglect a pillar, it's going to start be unmaintained, so to speak. And it also is interesting how each pillar will affect the other ones. They're all part of that same building. When one a pillar is stronger, it's going to help keep the other ones up. When one pillar is weaker, it's actually going to start shifting over and actually put more pressure on the other pillars. And so it's an upward and downward cycle. And you were mentioning earlier about the people who helped heal themselves. And a lot of the time, some of the things like eating more cleanly, having more water, those are physical aspects, even though they do help the mental aspect as well. And obviously a little bit of spirituality in there too. But it is interesting how you have to build up at least one pillar first and focus on one and then spread out. And it's one thing I've been kind of experimenting with the idea is the idea that everyone has their own pillar that they choose first. And I, I've met some people who focus more on the spirituality pillar before they did anything physically or mentally. Personally, I grew up as a fitness instructor and I always loved the body and like improving myself that way. And I think you're probably similar to that as well with all your Zen athlete stuff. But I I focused through a lens to the body pillar, despite the fact each one should have its own viewpoint. I should tackle the mental development in its own right. But oftentimes I view it from a physical perspective. How can I get that mind body connection, so to speak? So what are your thoughts on that? Well, absolutely. Yeah, that's, I think, uh, all right, let me, let me backtrack. The body mm -hmm. is the easiest way to start control. So if you are eating crappy food, it affects your mind, right? All those chemicals mm -hmm. in there, it affects your mind. So one of the quickest ways to kind of get a reset in actually doing it right now was I just do like a couple day fast or just something like uh, my friend of mine has a juice company with like 13 pounds of produce in a juice. So <laughs> you know, I stop eating, right? And then I'm like, okay, for 24 hours, I don't eat anything. And then maybe I have a juice for one or two days. That's it. Just, and what it does is it, it helps me think more clearly. Um, it resets all the habits, right? Because food is a, a, we're all chemical. So we just crave these chemical things. And so we're going to start to do that. So we need to take control of our body that assists our mind. And then it, it shows us, okay, now that we've got control of this, it starts to open our possibilities because we kind of get in these loops and we don't even, we can't see clearly. We don't even realize that we're being inhibited. And so it's, it's really crucial. And the body is the easiest way. Uh, Mark divine who wrote, I think it's like the unbeatable mind. He's a former Navy seal. And what he'll do basically is what the Shaolin monks would do is they'll just, he'll just break your body. He's like, you want to know uh, spirituality or you want to get in the moment or you want to experience Zen? And he goes, the easiest way is I'll just make them climb to the top of this mountain and then I'll, I'll make them so tired that their body will give out, right? They can't focus anywhere else. And then all of a sudden they're just trying to get to that next step and it opens you up. And I think <laughs> that, that that's a really uh, crucial element to understanding this because what's happening in our culture is we're being pacified. Right. Everything is so easy. It's always given to us. And we're, we're not it's like the movie Wall-E where we're in those little, uh, you know, things and we don't <laughs> like, even walk anymore. We get rolled in little... beds. Yeah, we've got. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of what's happening. So we've got to push ourselves into the uncomfort. And I think that's what's not common now. And that's why I really like uh, David Goggins as an example. I think he's a crazy example. And yeah. I'm not going to go that hard. But I, I go much harder than 90% of people in some sort of way. I'm pushing myself physically into discomfort so that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm expanding what I'm capable of. And, and and every time I've done that, it's given me some sort of emotional, physical, spiritual benefit. And one more example might be the cold training. So yeah. whenever I see somebody do something that's like supposed to be hard or it gives you enlightenment, like meditating for 10 days. So I did like that intensely, but even longer, um, you know, train with the monks, go to Tibet. I do those things to see what, what will happen. Will I become enlightened? Will I, will I get the thing that I'm, um, you know, wanting? And so then Wim Hof starts out there with the cold training. I'm thinking, crap, like I'm going to have to do that because he's doing it and I want, and I have to know what it'll do. So last year I was able to do it because I wanted to do it in the outdoors, right? I didn't want to do it in an ice bath. I just want, I'm Canadian, you know, yeah. we've got some amazing mountains. Yeah. So I had the right time <laughs> to do it and I spent the winter, you know, doing it consistently. And immediately it's a mind, body, spirit thing because you go into the water and your body is saying, get out. Your mind is saying, yeah. you know, get out. And so your body wants you to get out, but then you're having this ter internal dialogue going on immediately. So now you're focused on the mind. And then, then you take control of the body. So the mind takes control of the body, right? And then you have a spiritual experience because you're breathing and you're fully in the moment. And all you're coming back to is like, we're, we're staying here. And so what's happening is uh, Dr. Joseph Spenza says that addiction is when the body becomes the mind. 
And that's so mm-hmm. fascinating because who is running our body? Why do we show up the places we show up? Why do we eat what we eat? Why do we do anything, right? Uh, most of that stuff is unconscious. Even mm-hmm. though we think we're consciously making the choice, it's all really unconscious. We haven't gone down and filtered through all the programming to see why we do what we do. And so when you flip it like that and you start to take control of your body, um, you start to become much more empowered. And so the cold training is a fantastic starter for some people. Also breath work because breath work focuses you in the moment. And so there's a lot of tools for it, but it is really all about, um, you know, that that synergy right there. But you have to have control of the mind and then the body. And then that's when you get the spiritual, um, you know, esoteric or um, unseen world kind of play their part well i i totally love that and i remember seeing a couple of videos the title was like not wem hof kind of thing because i saw you like in the lake or something like that with the cold training and it's interesting too because it really does work that train that method does work at keeping you still when you're in the water or keeping you not cold in that case but it's also interesting how the wim hof method can also work in other cases too like i saw a video of him doing it with push-ups and just trying to do as many push-ups as you can physically and through the method he was able him and his student were able to do a lot more and one use actually i did it in the pool and so I'm a swim instructor, so I spent a lot of time in the pool, and I've always wanted to try to increase my lung capacity and try to just last longer underwater. And it's interesting, too, because the hot tub that I have at my pool has always been something that's very relaxing. A lot of people love, love it because it makes their muscles relaxed. However, it does increase the heart rate. It's obviously hot. It's making you very physically active because you're in that hot environment. But with the Wim Hof method, I was able to slow down my heart rate despite the heat. And I remember doing this training one day where... I turn off the jets because I don't like the distraction of that and just have a nice, serene, calm water. It's No one's in the pool either because it's a nice, <laughs> empty pool that day. And I'm sitting there in the water going up, getting my breath, going back down. And I, I did the Wim Hof method right at the end, basically, right at the beginning, right at the end. So I did it at the beginning, kind of get my heart rate in the right position as best I could. I kind of failed a little bit at the method, but I did it as best I could. Went back down to the bottom of the floor, came back up when I needed to, went back down, and each time I'm doing it very slowly, staying calm, and I came back up, and I I'll go down farther and farther each time. I stay a little bit longer and longer each time, and just relaxing. And on the 20th one, I did the Wim Hof method again. I'm all, I'm all the way calm at that point, physically and mentally. And I get down underwater and I held my breath for over a minute and a half, which is the longest I've ever done it. And it was because of that method that I was able to actually get to that physical state and just be that relaxed in the water. And I thought that was interesting. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, breath is incredibly important. And I love how Wim Hof is just making it accessible to everyone. He's not saying, hey, I'm super special. You need to have all these special things. Um, You know, you can actually try this method. And so we're all learning as a culture of people. And when I first did the videos, what I did is uh, the, the reason why I said the not Wim Hof method is because through martial arts, in the training that I've done, I always find it best to do it your own way first. Um, you don't always have to like, just take them as suggestions, be your own master, you know, be your own creator and be your own teacher. And so I was like, all right, I'm just going to go do this and see what happens. And so that's what I did for a while. And then I compared it to the Wim Hof, um, you know, breathing to see if it would make any, make it any easier. And the, the breath, the breathing method for me, it didn't make it any easier at all. Um, but what it, but it is a good practice, right? It's just a good practice for so many reasons. Um, but I, I like that, that mix of like trying strategies, but also thinking about it in your own way, right? Always yeah. making it your own. And I think I, I learned that originally from Bruce Lee, because that's how I learned martial arts. He would say, take what works for you and disregard what doesn't always make it your own test yourself, um, be your authentic self. And so everybody's got a strategy and enjoy it, but always remember to test it in your own way, right? Because you might come up with something new. You might make it unique to how you are. And I think that's really, really important. We don't want to be carved, uh, was it carbon copies of, of other people? Yeah. We want to be uniquely ourselves. Well, and I love that too, because one thing I like to do is combine things. And so the polymathic approach would be to take a whole bunch of different kind of breathing methods and try to find a way to squeeze them together in some unique way. Uh, so one of my old guests brought up the Okanaga breathing method, where you breathe in and breathe out for a full minute. So for like the first 30 seconds, you're breathing in, the first, the last 30 seconds, you're breathing out. And that elongated breath helps train your body, train your mind. And it's very interesting too, because you were mentioning the spirituality and how it's body first, then mind, then spirit. 
And I always felt to me that, like you said, a lot of our actions are unconscious. We don't control them. And it's the subconscious mind often doing those automated tasks. And so one thing I like to do to kind of view spirituality is the bridge between the conscious and subconscious mind. And so I thought I'd just bring that up to you. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's incredibly important because, you know, our conscious mind can only handle a little bit of information. I think it's like five to eight bits or however they measure that. And actually, I remember trying to read a book on consciousness in my teenage years, and it was so dense, and I only got through the first chapter. But that was, that was one of the things I remembered. It says five to eight bits of information, but your subconscious mind um, remembers almost everything. It can hold up in extraordinary amounts of memory from your entire life. And the other thing that I've heard is that your body stores that energy. And so you have limited capacity. So when we're not living in a way where we are processing what we're experiencing, meaning that let's just say um, your dog got run over by a yellow truck when you were nine years old. Um, you know, subconsciously, if you went on a date with a person 20 years later and they come up with a yellow truck, you might not even remember that scenario or something, you know, but it's going to affect and influence how you treat that person that that we know that yeah. will happen. But also if you have trauma, right, and if it's really serious trauma, you usually store that in the body. So if you haven't processed that trauma, a lot of people will get uh, cancers or different illnesses in the place they're storing that actual energy. So I just feel like that's a very fascinating thing. Um, but when we when we talk about the subconscious versus the conscious mind, the nice thing is the subconscious mind can be programmed. And we're so often focused on the, the conscious mind, but really all that conscious mind is doing is like a monkey monkey mind. It can only focus, you know, it can only focus on the present moment if it's if it's being used properly. If not, you you can use it in contemplation, which is also helpful. There's levels of like thinking, consideration and contemplation. So that's also useful. But most of the time we get up and we we you know, get ready for the day and our head starts spinning on the tasks, we're not, we're not really exercising our mindset anyways. And so learning how to program your mind is incredibly important. Um, hypnosis is super easy. Um, programming your subconscious mind is super easy. Uh, they aren't permanent or quick fixes. They're alterations into who you are. So, well, yes, it does become permanent, but sometimes you need to work on it depending on what it is. So you can go from a mindset where you um, believe certain things about your life, about your business, about your capabilities, about your health. You can then program um, what you prefer on the other side, who you want to create, the person you want to architect, right? Mm -hmm. Which can be anything and, and anyone. And so like the example that I give is... Um, uh, I had an athlete, Brody Carmichael, who, you know, I, I was doing extreme sports coaching for a long time on the mental game. And I had one athlete reach out and said, Hey, I, I fell on a front flip. Um, I heard you're a good trainer. Like, can you help me with that? Cause he was on his motorcycle and probably didn't want to fall again. And so yeah. I said, yeah, man, no problem. We can do that. So we had a chat and his mental game was strong. You have to have a strong mental game to do that sport. And, um, you know, I kind of tweaked a few things here and there with, with some different perspectives. And I said, Hey, look, you can read my book, but you don't have to, but it'll help. Like you'll you'll definitely um, gain from it and you could do my course because i had a, a, a peak performance course so you can do that but but you don't have to um it's going to help with understanding but you don't need to what you have to do this is what you have to do is you have to visualize that front flip every single day until you know you can land it and i'd suggest an hour and so um he said okay he started visualizing it the next day and three weeks later he lands a the front flip three weeks after that it was the world's first front flip heel clicker and three weeks after that the world's first front flip superman on a motorcycle and at that time he wasn't even on his bike he was going around to schools talking to a uh, different uh, kids about whatever not bullying or something something good because he's an awesome human and so he ended up doing that straight up through visualization now if you take another example with health people when they have a terminal illness like cancer or something like that right they don't think about all this stuff they're they're usually in a high stress state right they're just running the patterns that they're doing they're not really thinking about their diet most of the time right this is nine times out of ten anyways and so then they then they say holy crap like this is a very serious thing i need to heal myself so they start looking at alternatives and then they find everything they can about nutrition which is incredibly important breath work incredibly important um decreasing stress incredibly important and then adding the visualization adding that that mindset of like i am now in control of my body just like when you go in the water and, and your body says get out you say no you can also tell your body to heal itself now it doesn't make it a hundred percent of the time it just massively increases the probability. So just mm -hmm. like when, I, when I'm teaching Brody to do that uh, front flip, 
he's not going to land it 100% of the time, but it massively increased his probability of success. And it was the injury or the harm or the catalyst that brought him to that level of training. So it's accessible to all of us, but we're usually not brought to it until we are forced with some sort of injury or harm. And so there's another example. I was just uh, interviewed for uh, Rethink Fit, which is this group on a, a new platform, and they do a lot of amazing stuff. Um, they run retreats and do all this different type of stuff. But I was on their show and there was a bodybuilder on there, Marco. I can't remember his last name, but he became a world champion bodybuilder. And then uh, he got in a motorcycle accident and became a paraplegic. He wasn't, they said, you're not, you know, you got like a one or 2% chance of walking and, you know, you're, this is your life. He's already walking. He's using his arms. He's doing all these things. It was like a, you know, they were telling him he was toast. He's already doing it. And so we don't know how far he could go. So he used that same mindset to become a professional bodybuilder and achieve success in sport. But what's most impressive is now they're like, oh, you'll never walk in is already doing it right after a few yeah. years. So it's incredibly inspiring. And there's countless stories of that using, using that sub, whether you want to call it subconscious gets into the spiritual, but it's directing the capabilities of the body in conjunction with spirit, you know? So, and then the last mm -hmm. thing I want to say in this rant with, you know, I think to get up to spirit, right? It, spirit is always there. It's always within you. We're just accessing that and cultivating that. So the body, because it can be trained like a wild horse or like a wild monkey, if, if we've never had that experience, breath work are just exhausting yourself will bring in that present moment will bring in that stillness will allow uh you know the spirit to come in because it's required stillness you need to be laser focused you need to be aware you can't be having a monkey mind so that will help bring that connection if it's unfamiliar to you yeah and it's interesting too because another point you mentioned earlier that came up again is the idea of patience like it's, it's going to take time and one thing i want to mention before because it's going to keep distracting my brain if i don't is the idea of just habits and like actually trying to get everything incorporated into your life meditation fitness nutrition all these different aspects of your life and at one point i don't know if this is like 2013 2015 this was before i was really active with self-development like i was pursuing it especially in various different ways but I wasn't systematic about it and I wasn't very effective at doing a lot of it. And I kept thinking, okay, well, I want to keep doing meditation. I, I'm already an exercise person. I want to be keeping up my exercise. I also want to learn languages. So let's work on Duolingo. Let's take these courses that are just new. Cause I, it was like 2013, like MOOCs were still a brand new thing basically. And all these different aspects that I wanted to go into. Like I had, I was so stressed out. Like how am I going to fit all of this into a daily habit? or daily kind of thing. And I remember this kind of being like trying to visualize and trying to understand and trying to think, how can I put this into my life? And I started visualizing how, what kind of person would be who's doing all these different things. And nowadays I have these, most of them into a system. Like I don't do Duolingo much, but I read, I did meditation today, even for a few minutes. Like I didn't do it for very long, but I wanted to make sure I did it before coming into our meeting today. I also did my exercise this morning because I, I made a system out of it. Since I work at a fitness place, I can go work out pretty quickly and easily. And so I, I was able to make these more into habits and I was able to visualize what my life would be like in that way. So I wanted to bring that up. Yeah, that well, that's amazing. I remember something similar where I was going through all these different things you could do. There's so many different things. And at one point, my morning routine was like two hours, three hours. In. So it was getting <laughs> ridiculous. So the first thing that I'll say is that be easy on yourself in the process, right? Especially if you want to grow like personal development. I love uh, Alan Watts. He'll talk about, um, you know, how personal development is, is absurd, like self-help is absurd. Who are, who are you helping? And, and so mm -hmm. it's an interesting um, perspective. And the way he frames it is is very impressive. But a lot of my studies have been around Zen as well. And Zen is almost like the non-doing, right? There's the doing and then there's the, the non-doing. There's the acceptance. There's, um, you know, non-judgment, uh, surrender, right, to something to bigger uh, non-comparison things like that and so i think that this is an important piece that the western culture misses that the eastern culture has is this level of contentment so we do want to be efficient for sure and we will upgrade our systems for sure um and you want to write them down and you want to be diligent about that you know how am i taking care of my health what's what's the bare minimum that i can do uh how am i taking care of my body what's you know what's the bare minimum how am i, how am I taking care of my mind and be really uh thoughtful and considerate with that then set up a system what happens is sometimes people well, whenever I'm coaching people, that was choose way too much. I say, okay, great. And then the next week, you know, we, we refine them and say, what, what's your minimum dose 
don't then figure that out and don't compromise on that. Right. But then also, how do you cultivate your life? So you're doing the things you want to do all day. And so that's kind of the strategy that I've employed. So who has the time to train martial arts all day? Who's got the time to meditate with monks all day? You know what I mean? I figured out how I would do that. And so yeah. right, who's, who's got the time to, uh, you know, snowboard and whistler all day. And, and that was my first thing that when I left school, I was like, I want to travel. I want to learn. So I was in Whistler snowboarding every single day, getting paid for it, coaching the athletes that I wanted and also researching about human potential, peak performance and other things. And, um, you know, so progressing in that way. So design your life around what's most important, right? You're going to get closer and closer and closer. So in Whistler, for example, it started with uh, teaching beginners in Calgary because I wanted to land in Whistler. I had no money, I had no resources, didn't have anything. I started an online um, little product that was teaching snowboarding, and that started to help my second year when I landed in Whistler. Then by the third year, I was teaching mostly people who wanted to ride the snowboard park that had an okay level where I could hit the the good jumps. I didn't like there's a baby park and then there's a medium park. So I was the medium park is fine for me. I can, they're big enough jumps for me to work on everything I wanted to work on, but I was, I was able to integrate that into my life. And so I feel like it's always, um, something that you're going to need to adapt and refine. And so it's very important to write it down and give it consideration. What's most important. Is it meditation? Is it breath work? Is it training for me? It was challenging because I want to do everything. I couldn't go to the gym yeah. as much as I'd like and then skateboard. So I was like, you know what? Skateboarding is more fun. It's better than me being able to deadlift 500 pounds. Cause that was my goal. I got to like 463, and I was like, it'd be, it'd be cool to deadlift 500 pounds. And so, um, I, I thought about that, but then I had to let it go because skateboarding was more important. And so, you know, you have these goals and aims and growth. Um, this is the example that I give when I'm coaching. And I think it's a great example. You know, if you think about a child who is five years old, like, are they good enough then? Are they good enough when they're 10 years old and they know how to ride a bike? Are they good enough when they're in high school or do they become good enough and whole and complete in college or when they start their first business or when they buy the first house or when they have the first baby? It's kind of this never ending thing, right? And so often as humans, we want to grow and get to this next thing. So mm -hmm. I feel like if we imagine ourselves like a, a flower, you know, it starts as a seed and it's like, is the seed good enough before it pops out of the soil? Is it good enough when it makes its first little leaf? Is it good enough when it flowers? And so when when we're progressing through life, if we're doing things that are aligned with our values, with who we are, with our curiosities, with, and, it, and it helps people, it doesn't harm people, right? Um, and we're growing. And if we can be content where we are in the process, and that's where people really struggle, I think, you know, myself included, and many of the people I've worked with is always yeah. needing to get to that next step, right? You're always, you're always whole, complete, uh, harmonious, wherever you are. And if you can learn to be content with who you are, with what you have, with what you know, uh, for you, probably with what you read, right? You're like me, you've got nine courses. Yeah. Right? And I just, I would dust this massive course and I'm like, oh, then I'll know. And then I'll dust this other massive course and then I'll know, right? And it's just like, I'll go, I'll go yeah, I'll go oh, trade with the salad mugs. Yeah, exactly. Then I'll know, right? And it's just this unfolding. And so that's, I feel like the missing piece, right? And that's why I really love the yin yang, yin yang type of yeah. scenario that you are perfect now and everything is just going to be an expression of your growth. So yes, do it, but also remember to be loving and kind and compassionate to yourself in that process. Well, and being present in the moment again, like you're saying, and I think it's interesting too, you were mentioning on one of the last tangents about basically around flow, being in that moment, being in the zone, so to speak. And I, I wanted to touch on that too, because I think it leads into your Zen athlete pretty well. It's uh, There was a story I wanted to share with you that at one point, push-ups became one of my main stays when it came for exercise. When I wanted to push myself to a new limit, I would do a lot of other things too, but like push-ups were the main course that I was going to focus on. And at one point, I was getting to 200, 220, 240 push-ups. And I'm, I'm not doing these in a row per se, but I'm doing them in one sitting. And at one point, I'm like, I want to do 300. And I get there and I ran out, I, I just sat down, I got to the 240 or no, 220 and I ran out of time, had to go work and I felt frustrated. I failed and I, I just didn't do it well enough. I don't think 
came back a week later, and I'm sitting down on the mats, and I crank out another 240 push-ups, and I had 15 minutes left until my client was there. At that point, I had already fallen on my face three times, my arms were numb from all the lactic acid, my, I, I couldn't push up anymore, like I physically was incapable of it. I had to do reps of one, or sets of like one or two, just to get to that point in the first place. And I'm sitting there and it's like, no, I want to do this. I want to get to 300. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not leaving here until I do it. And that, and that 15 minutes, I'm sitting there and just spending a couple of minutes kind of visualizing what is it going to be like? How am I going to be that person who's going to do it? And so, like, I'm not going to leave here until I do it. I don't care if I'm late for work at this point. I'm, I'm going to get it done. And at that point, I'm laying there on the mat like this, just face down and, like, I can't push up at all. And I'm sitting there like, okay, well, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to do it. I'm going to finish this. And because of that decision, because of that action that I wanted to take already kind of concreted in my mind, I got into the fight or flight state. So the adrenaline kicked in and I was able to stay into the state of flow and focus and be able to push myself past those last 60 reps and finish that goal of doing 300. And I thought that flow would be an interesting topic to talk on. Yeah, well, first of all, I love that story, and and there's always value in pushing yourself, right? And and it, then it becomes into this will game. Um, so when speaking about flow, you know, I was researching that before it became super cool, which I'm glad it has because it's a fantastic topic. Um, and so what I've noticed though in the you know the mainstream here, it's like flow is. Um, something where you you do this thing and then you're automatically in that state. And when I'm training athletes or myself or coaching, I'm like flow state is earned, right? You mm -hmm. don't you don't go hit a 60 foot wave and you're because of your flow state you can do that. There are years yeah. of work, right, for you to perform at that level. Now, if you're gonna go do something, if you're about to perform, there are absolutely techniques that work. Um, so for my Olympic athletes, you know what I would say because they'd be in skiing or snowboarding, um, I'd, I'd I'd show them how to do a trigger, which when you get into emotional states from neuro-linguistic programming and just help you generate an emotion. So what's the emotion you need? Confidence, calm. Um, we would just list all those different down, those different things and put it to emotional trigger. So it might be squeezing a hand or something. You can do that kind of stuff. We would visualize the run, but the more they visualize, the second they would know that course, we would have a guided meditation for them that would go through the course of exactly what they're going to do. So then they're earning their flow state, right? They're mm -hmm. prepared. Right, A Navy SEAL doesn't go into a scenario and say, oh, my flow state's going to help me through this crazy thing. They actually have a saying that they say is uh, you don't rise to the occasion. You fall to the level of your training. And it's such a different way to think about it. So flow state is earned. And when you recognize that, you can go get it and you can go do things. And when it happens, it's amazing how the body responds. It's it's truly extraordinary. Um, you know, there are, there are many cases of like, they call it the timelessness or you're out of body yeah. or all these different things. And often it's through sport because sport will 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 give you the... Um, the catalyst, right? The, the joy mm -hmm. to earn it, right? Nobody like, I wouldn't do all this training for no reason, but because I want to get better at martial arts, I do the cardio, I do the stretching, I do kick in the bag. I push myself because I like to express the body and it's, and it's super cool and it's fun. It gives me a reason to, that's why I feel like people need to figure out what they're curious about, what they're passionate about, because you can enter flow through art, through music, through writing, mm -hmm. through many different things. And so, you know, when we understand like what really creates flow and, and so, you know, in the books and athlete, I kind of pinpoint those pillars exactly like you said. And I was like, all right, these are the elements and they're dedication. So it has to matter mm -hmm. to you. If it doesn't matter, you're not going to dedicate to it. You need to be able to focus and understand what focus is, how to generate focus, not understand when you're not focused meditation. It's just, if you don't know how to quiet your mind, you're not going anywhere. Uh, visualization, yeah. your belief and what your limiting beliefs are, figuring out what those are. And you can install positive beliefs, the beliefs that you actually want. You can do that. Simulation. So for you in a pool, right, you're, you're already doing simulation or in, in snowboarding, we would be on the trampoline or, or different things like that. Uh, fitness and nutrition, what you put in your body and goal setting. And so when you synergize that whole thing, you know, I put basically Zen in the middle or that would be flow. So if you have one pillar that's way off, off, you know, yeah. in that moment, you will not have earned it the same way you're going to get. It's like, a, this is a good analogy. I've never even thought about this before. Like the power <laughs> bar and like Mortal Kombat or something like these games, yeah. and it will go up. And at one point you get the full power, but you could use like, you know, at it 25% or at 50% or at a hundred percent. And we don't even know what the capacity is. We don't even know how far it could go, but we do know if we are 
in balance, we're listening to our body, we have a good structure, and um, we're putting the right things in, when when performance time comes, we're going to be able to perform and have that result. And there's, you know, there's no more a greater master than the Navy SEALs, right? Because they, they yeah. don't, no excuses allowed. You finish the 300 pushups, you be successful in the business, you do yeah. that thing. And, and, and the other thing I'll add too is uh, just failure. Failure is okay, but you yeah. don't quit. Failure is totally yeah. fine, right? If you mess up that thing, that's fine. Go do your job. Go figure it out. You know that yeah. I think the war movie where the leg guy, guy's leg gets blown off, or it's like, and all that is like, can you do your job? That's we don't care about anything else. Can you do your job? Yes. Okay. Great. And so otherwise they they reorganize. So um, yeah. So that's my rant. Yeah. On low state. Yeah. No, I like it, and it made me think of two things. I don't know if you are thought about this much, but there was a guy named Wilson Melancelli, and he brought this to my attention when I watched his content on flow that it's in cycles, and a lot of people don't realize you have to recover after being in flow state because the flow state is such a powerful state of the brain filling out all those chemicals, neurochemicals in there, and there's a time of recovery afterwards. After you get into that state, you have to let your body, more particularly the chemistry of your mind, recuperate its resources. So that power bar, like you mentioned in there. Once you use it, it takes a while for that power bar to go back up. And there's a certain time delay before you can get into the state again. I mean, I'm sure that there's you could, but then you would burn yourself out more quickly if you did. And the other thing was that I was teaching a swim lesson at one point, and this this girl was one of my top students. Uh, she was strong. She, had, she was capable. She knew to form well. Physically and mentally, she was good. And even spiritually, I would even say she pushed herself quite a bit as well, having that grit. But there was one point where when I told her to do a lap, she would take five breaths, two on the way down, one at the wall, two on the way back. And that's not bad. For most people, that's actually pretty good. But I told her, do it in one. One breath. That's it. And that's particularly probably at the wall, presumably. You could do it whenever, but that's probably the most ideal place. And all I wanted her to do was try. She goes down. She takes one breath on the way down. She takes a breath at the wall. And she takes one breath on the way back. Three breaths. And she was sitting there mentally just like, oh, I failed. Like, oh, I didn't actually do it. You told me to do it in one and I failed. It's like, but you still did it in three. Like, you you, you did the job. You did what I asked. You had focused on trying and actually getting better. And that was the whole point behind it. And she succeeded because she tried and pushed herself past what her previous limitation was. And I don't know if she got into the flow state, but I thought it was an interesting story nonetheless of pushing past using that grit. A hundred percent. Yeah. And I think that redefining failure is so important. And as we get older, the way people think about it is really their, their biggest inhibitor of doing what they want. You know, basically of everyone that I coach and been going around the world, traveling to all these different countries, I'm just curious about how you live your life. How do you design your life? What's most important to you? And if, and if you're not doing any of those things, why not? What's, what's the reason why you, you don't do it? And, and fear is always the inhibitor and it's always around money. And, um, you know, when you think like that, you're, you're, you're limiting your capability. You know, I, I, I give the example sometimes where like, just imagine right now or, or, or 10 years from now, you're, um, you have a, right now you break your legs and, and you can't, can't use your legs. You have lost use of your legs or, or you go blind or something. Well, in 10 mm -hmm. years from now, you can either have a million dollars or you can have your eyesight back. You know, which one are you going to choose? And, and always they choose the body part. So I say, okay, well, just imagine you pursued your dreams wholeheartedly and you failed and you became homeless. You would still get another job, right? And so you could work a full-time job and then just put a little bit of time each night onto what your passion and curiosity was. Well, over a year or over 10 years, um, you're going to have massive results. And there's, I think there's some sort of universal law around consistency. You know, it's like the power mm -hmm. of consistency is compounding. Like that example they'll give is like, do you want a million dollars at the end of the month uh, at 30 days or do you want one penny doubled? And that's kind yeah. of like consistency. And so, you know, if we just are consistently – doing an honest reflection and review of what's important to us, putting some time and energy and will into what's important to us, our life is going to be guided in a very different way. And I see that people, they live their life by default, right? Or they create it on purpose. They architect their life. And it's not an easy operation a lot of the time. In fact, it's very difficult, but it's very meaningful. So you can have your life architected for you by someone else's agenda that is easy, that will provide you these things, or you could do something else. And so I've met so many different people who've done it in so many different creative ways, really focusing on what the values are and then letting go of all these other things. And when it comes to failure, like um, one, one person I was working with was a writer and she was good at it. And it's interesting when people are good at something, they're more worried about what people think, you know? So I could, you know, art, I suck at art. I can 
put a picture of an art and throw it up there because I don't care. But if somebody's good at art, they might be more hesitant about showing it because their identity is on the line, right? You know, what if people don't like it? And so we need to reframe and understand that failure is necessary. Failure is important. You are going to fail. Um, failure is going to teach you something, right? You know, there's something like the master has failed more times than the beginner has tried. And so just redefine your relationship with failure and just understand it's a necessary part of the pro process. It's all right, right? Just don't yeah. stay down. So, and you, you they, people take it so personally, right? So with the, with the girl who is the writer, I just said, just start posting some of the stuff you write. And I said, just imagine all your friends and everyone you love writes you a letter and tells you how terrible it was. If you can still do it, then then you're in a mastery mode because it doesn't matter what other people think. It matters yeah. that it matters to you. <laughs> it matters it's that it's meaningful thing. for you. So don't inhibit that. Yeah, no. And just on a small tangent here, I created Poly Innovator, my personal brand, as a foundation for all the careers I want to have in life. I wanted to architect what I do in the future. And if people don't like it, they don't like it. And I, I've had people give me hate mail or something like that. Not much because I'm not that big yet. But it's one of those things where some people have been kind of hard on me about it. And it's like, okay, that sucks. But that's your opinion. You're entitled to having your opinion. This is how I think, and I'm going to make sure I keep pushing at it. I'm going to keep getting back up. If I get knocked down, I'll keep moving forward. If I get knocked down, I'll keep moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And it's rough that people are like that because, um, you know, that's that's a, a lot of the reason why people don't end up doing anything. Just do something. You know what I mean? It always evolves. And, and usually your first few iterations aren't what you'd like it to be, just like in health or in skateboarding. You know, skateboarding is a really great trainer and, and, and teacher because you just fail constantly. And so, yeah. you know, be the person out there that encourages your friends to any idea. Give give insight, insightful feedback. You know, fortunately, I haven't got too much hate either, but sometimes I get some ridiculous stuff and um like even sometimes when people are trying to be helpful i've had that recently too and i'm like man i can't i can't do everything you know it's like i'm doing the best that i can like i wish it was like joe rogan and aubrey marcus but yeah. like they have tons of money you know like I'm, I'm doing this full time and you know people don't understand sometimes the dedication like my choice for my life when it was like five years ago before that was travel and exploration and education then when i started the podcast i was like okay it's podcast research and education and so i've been to 25 countries you can't do that well maybe you can i don't know but i wasn't able to do it i wasn't able to do 25 countries and start a million dollar business it you know yeah. there's only so much time you have so my number one focus was education and experience and travel and then the podcast was my service and something that i could give to the community in the world and so that's what i focused on and continue to focus on and so it's like 40 to 60 hours a week for five years so when people say you know how do you make money in podcasting i was like let me know when you figure it out you know so yeah. um i'll be happy to know well Affiliate links are the best way, I feel like, with podcasting, because you really don't want to do sponsorship too much, and podcasting's not really the monetization. Like, the best way, I guess, is to do what the Joe Rogan did and just get bought out to go exclusive, go. I guess. That's, <laughs> that's like, the, probably the only way to truly do it. But podcasting's not the money monetization, it's the other aspects. But speaking of which, your book, Zen Athlete, you mentioned that earlier, and so I wanted to ask you, too, what is the ethos of the Zen Athlete brand? Yeah, so when I started that and I wrote that book, I was doing um, you know so much peak performance training for athletes, and I realized that this wasn't common knowledge, right? It's old school; it's been around forever, but it's still not popularized. So my hope was that you know if I could dream big, it would it would be to popularize the mental game of athletics because we could Trojan horse consciousness and spiritual principles through people wanting to be better athletes, right? So a, you know a, a student that's ten years old doing basketball is probably not going to meditate, but if you can tell him that it's going to make him a better athlete he might now be open to that he's going to be open to visualization and if i break down the the book and its most core principles it's um it's three fundamental shifts in consciousness and so if you're going to teach that student um how to how to throw a basketball shot the first thing is to tell them to clear their mind and so a, an individual who is able to clear their mind and someone who is not able to there's a fundamental shift in the in the quality of their consciousness their capabilities and their way of thinking that's and, and one of them is way more free if you can clear your mind you are much more free emotionally mentally spiritually in every single way the second thing is to visualize the shot going in and that will show you that you influence your reality that you actually can intend you can will you can create here you are influencing your reality and then the third thing 
is if they miss the shot. Well, what's the most powerful and positive perspective you can have in that situation? So if you go into stoicism, they say, you know, it's not so much what what happens to you in your life. It's how you feel about it, you know, your emotions, your judgments on it. And so if we say, okay, you know, what's the most powerful and positive perspective I can have in this situation? Um, you think about that and then you then reapply the will. And now you're in a process. And most adults don't know how to clear their mind. You know, some do. Uh, most of them don't use visualization. And most of them don't have the mindset where they're in a, in a growth mindset, as Carol Dweck would say, or or many other people and say, hey, you know, what, what can we do? How do we respond to this situation? And so there are other tools for peak performance in there, but you need that... Uh, you need that introduction, right? To yeah. lot, some, if you're if you're aligned with the path, then you're 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 cool with it. You're 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 all about it. You're into the meditation. You're into the visualization. But if you're not, you need that entryway. That's not so um, difficult and challenging. And so it's all the best tools and processes um, that I've learned um, for peak performance, for mindset, for flow state, for all of those different things in a very simple and applicable way. And so, yeah. So my hope is with for athletes, and but even individuals and high achievers, artists, things like that. It's all, it's all relevant to them as well. Well, and I would even say polymaths, people who are multidisciplinary could benefit from reading the book too, because it's one of those things where a lot of things you're trying to achieve in life, if you want to do multiple things in life, you have to find the opportunity cost, but you also might be able to do all the things you want to do. But in order to do that, you have to be in your optimal state. And you mentioned stoicism, and I believe this is a stoicism quote, but it's the idea of uh, if you're stressed out about a uh, something situation that's happened to you, the question is, can you do anything about it? Yes? Well, then go do it. No? Well, then there's something you can worry about. Because there's, if you can't do anything about it, then no. And so in both cases, you have to just let it go. Because you you literally can't, you can or can't do anything about it. And if you can, go do it. If you can't, then leave it be. And I think that's a very interesting point as well. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, it's like the serenity prayer. It's like, uh, mm. I forget exactly what it is, but it's like, give me the wisdom to understand the things I can change and those that I can't, you know? And so it's, it's so important. Right. And then how can you find genuine peace? Right. Because life is frustrating. You know, Alan Watts says that, uh, you know, in Buddhism, they'll say life is suffering, but he goes more accurately. The translation is life is frustrating and life is frustrating. You know, it is a, it's challenging. There's constantly constant challenges, but the stronger we become, the more resilient we become, um, we are able to rise to those challenges. And with that mindset, it's such a fundamental shift. And I feel like with everything going on in the world, their con the the education or the mindset is around like you know some sort of outside savior or something to do the work for you or something to make it easier but you know that's why i liked uh, training with the native american elder david lombear senapas because it was it was not fancy it's actually getting harder getting more resilient uh, more simple and more challenging and that gives you the skills so if it does get easier that's great you know what i mean but you can grind yeah. it out you no know, matter what and it's just such a different uh, mindset. So we do want effective tools and effective processes. And at the same time, we want to be aware of, um, of the reality of the situation and not being so soft, you know, we're always kind of lured into this softness and this easiness, right. And so we just want to kind of pay attention to that and, um, and be aware that there's going to be effort involved. And so be very clear on what that end goal is. And is it meaningful? What do you want to effort towards? Why? So Mike Bloodsoe is a friend of mine and he had like, he had the Barbell Shrug podcast is like the biggest uh, health podcast in the world. And, you know, people would want him for coaching and, and different things. And he goes, half the time when people would uh, want me, want me to coach them, I would, I would ask them why they wanted to do this, why they wanted to do that. And at the end of the day, they didn't want to be big and strong with some sort of emotional thing. And so I would talk myself out of a client, right? But he's just like, yeah. it was always an emotional thing. Why do you want to work this hard to get that? What's the reason you want to do this? And when they break it down, it was actually something else. And so I think that's really important for us to analyze, you know, what, why do we want that end result? What are we actually getting? What's most important? Yeah, and you've taken into account a lot of different philosophies in your work, especially in your content or as an athlete. And you had a saying that I saw that your body is a temple of knowledge in an Egyptian proverb. And it's like, what are you doing with that body? Like, are you trying to make that temple stronger? Is that your motivation? You just want to build up that temple? Or maybe you want to understand the temple more. Maybe you want to understand why do we have this particular body that we do? Like, maybe you've made bad choices in the past. You need to learn from those choices. Maybe you made good choices and you're relatively healthy but you're not fit that kind of thing and so i wanted to ask you too how did your spiritual journey start and where do you see yourself going next 
Oh wow! Lot to, well, lot to go off there, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I th- I think I think every individual born hearing this ever existed is on a spiritual journey. You can't you can't not be. I think there can be a point where we choose to actively engage in it, engaging in the mystery of life and what it means to be alive. And those are the questions again. When I was young, I didn't understand how no one was asking. What's the meaning of life? Why are we here? What is actually going on? You know, and and I think Joe Rogan has a one of his old um, comedies. He's he just talks about how nobody has any idea what is going on here, and it's so true. I've talked about that often. We we really don't know. I've talked to some of the smartest minds in physics, spirituality, personal development. Read all the books. We only have a tiny little bit of information here, right? Like we really yeah. like you could break it down. Like what's going on in the body when this happens, but really. How much understanding is that in like your daily life, like maybe to apply it to some sort of scientific thing. But at the end of the day, you know, particles disappear and reappear. If you look at the, I forget that experiment, but they shoot particles through these two. Oh, that's the double slit. The two slit. Yeah. Yeah, So, right. And so then particles are disappearing and reappearing. So it's a very fascinating place to be. And consciousness is the tip of that exploration. And for me, when I was younger, I was like, okay, well, what the heck is this consciousness thing all about? How can I have an altered consciousness? If I can be awake when I'm when I'm sleeping and have a lucid dream, what does that mean about this physical reality? It's very confusing. And so, yeah. um, you know, the spiritual endeavor, I feel like, is to connect with who you really are, not mm-hmm. not the ego. Ego is good. Ego is just your identity. Right. But um, it's it's when you're doing like they call it maybe the false ego. It's like I want to get this car so I look cool. No, that's not the thing. If you actually want that car because you like that car, that's fine. Right. But if you then go sacrifice and do work that harms people, right? So you can go get that car, then you're doing it for ego. You you've now sold out. You've 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 spiritually compromised yourself, right? You gotta stay in spiritual integrity um, with yourself because we all know the difference between right and wrong. But we're gonna have preferences. That's our ego. we some of us will be brought to training, some of us entrepreneurship, some of us art, some of us music, some sort of expression. So that's who you are. That's a beautiful thing. Um, and so part of the spiritual journey is honoring that being who you are, who you're made to, who you were made to be, and then connecting with that unseen force. Some people call it God. Um, when I, with the, with the native Americans, they call it creator, um, spirit, nature, very connected to nature. Um, you know, religious people will be God, you know, whatever the case is, but you want to have that authentic connection and and the way that I've kind of broken down what I believe to be an enlightened man, and I'm sure there's a lot more than this, would be um, number one, you got to take responsibility for every single thing that's ever happened or will happen in your life, good or bad, because that way you're not a victim. Then you can change something, right? You know, then you have an opportunity to grow. Um, it's very important. Most people don't take re- responsibility. The second thing is you go from what can I get to what can I give? So as you develop your skills and your curiosities and your interests, you're going to develop a skill set that you can give back. So you can say, you know, what 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 can I give? And so this spiritual spiritual pursuit um, is real. You know, there I've had experiences in my life that make no sense, multiple of them. And I've talked to other people who've been on the same path, and um, they have experiences that make no sense at all. And you know that there is some sort of force here, but we are in a mystery. We can't know the answer, but we we always have this inner compass that tells us if it's right or wrong, good or bad, aligned or not aligned. If you go to work and you see this opportunity to kind of like, can you let someone in in traffic or do you cut them off? Well, you know, the right thing to do is just to let slow down and let them in. But if you're in a rush and you kind of cut them off, your, your signal says, you know what? That probably wasn't the right thing to do. That's it. You know, that's it. And it's how do you continue to make the choice of integrity over all the complications and challenges of life, you know, and having that connection. So meditation, they'll say, is like listening to God, right? Being able to quiet your mind, honoring who you are, honoring your body, honoring your community, being kind and compassionate to others. All of those things are spiritual principles. And I went to the Parliament of World Religions with my friend, David Lombier Senapas, who's a Native American elder. And there's like 200 and, you know, something different religions there. And, um, you know, whatever your beliefs are, that's fine. You know, believe whatever you'd, you'd like. And one of the things he said to me is like, you don't need a broker to God. You don't need any person, any church, anything, any book. You can get there directly. Now, do you want to use the books and the communities and things like that? That's fine. Um, He also said church is the people. Right. It's the people, you know, the community, the I've, I went to I've been to a lot of different churches. I've studied with a lot of different uh, religious um, 
you know, groups and the people are always the best. We might have yeah. a different story and a different belief, but nine times out of 10, they're fantastic communities. Um, so, so that's my rant on it. I feel like it's just being able to not compromise your soul and spirit. And it's just so challenging here because it's run by money. And that's where most people get compromised, right? They, they, they compromise because they think they need this, but they didn't contemplate it long enough. Like I didn't need, if I were like, oh, I need uh, this much money to live in Whistler and not work, um, that would be a lot of money. So I designed my life about, you know, actually working, but I got paid to do what I would do. So you can figure it out, but you have to let go of a lot of other stuff. Right. And so that's why getting incredibly clear is so valuable. And I think that too, the, like you said, the people is the real essence of it that you can connect with. And one thing I noticed with a lot of religions across the world is a lot of the stories are the same. The Great Flood has Hindu backgrounds. It has Judeo-Christian backgrounds. It has something even uh, in Islam too. And it's just interesting how a lot of the stories can maybe be interpreted differently, but we often have a lot of the similar kind of morals and coming out of it in the end, just different approaches to that and understanding each other and understanding the ways of life that other people might face and actually do. I'm trying to find the point that I was going to make there, but essentially speaking, coming together and understanding that there is a lot of compassion involved. And if you can just enjoy the people that are there, that could often be the connection you're looking for as well. Yeah, I think in, in the spirit of almost non-judgment as well, right? Like, you know, the core fundamentals, if you look across the religions, are very, very similar, right? And, you know, talking about the different ancient books, well, I also went to Egypt with the Resonant Science Foundation, and it was full of, you know, physicists and engineers and all this different stuff trying to figure out what the heck was going on with the pyramids. I've always been curious mm -hmm. about the pyramids and there's, there's thousands and thousands of ancient sites around the world. Um, I also was at the one in Cambodia, Angkor Wat, which is incredibly fascinating how these things are built. We don't know how, and we can't do it, you know? So mm -hmm. what was going on there? What is it? What, what is actually going on with human history, right? It's a, it's a very fascinating thing. And so, but if you look at those ancient stories, this, uh, the stories of Sumer, and of uh, all these cultures around the world, um, they have very similar stories of floods. So I studied with a Mayan elder, a Native American Mi'kmaq elder, and also a Zuni elder. And they all had a 20,000 year history. They were all oral. And um, they all talked about other beings. They talked about other energies. Um, the Mayan elder told me that we have 20 senses, um, but they're not fully uh, realized. And so maybe it's almost like we're this cycle of life. We're going to come into those new senses. I, I like to say it's like we're dolphins conditioned. We're goldfish. People need to realize that this environment they are in is, is a threat. Every Your food is killing every single thing if you peel it back is killing you you need to educate yourself and and um you know figure out what you're putting into your body how you think how you spend your time where you put your focus because all of it is to, to distract you from who you are and what you're capable of and that's that spiritual process again uh meditation uh whatever it is a good community right whatever that is be around good inspiring people make sure your work you have right livelihood as i say in buddhism i love uh the eightfold path right talks about mental nutrients uh, uh, you know, right values, right livelihood, all these different characteristics. And when you live in that way, you're going to find your tribe of people and it is a much more authentic way of living. And, and I, I, I see it very similar to the native Americans that I, um, have studied with. They are just the most authentic people, you know, the, the mm -hmm. most authentic and real, you know, mentors. And, and, yeah. and some of them have some pretty incredible stories that are mind blowing and make no sense because they have a totally different history than we do. Uh, they'll blow your mind, listen to their stories. Um, but, but, you know, they've been some of the, my most humble teachers. And so I can't remember where I was going with that, but, um, uh, that's my That's still amazing. Help. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and part of the show too, like considering the poly aspect, much or many topics, much or many rants, I guess you could say too. And it seems like you and I both really like to go meta. So we probably only have time for a couple more questions for the most part. I'll try to squeeze in as much as we can because there's a lot of really interesting ones. I'm not sure if you got a chance to read them beforehand, but so from all the various aspects to your content creation, to the multifaceted exercise routines you have, and even it seems like your life overall too, how do you balance it all? It's a good question. I think the way that I've done it in the past is I try to immerse myself in the thing that I love the most. So at the time it was snowboarding, at other times it's different things, there's martial arts. So that's my strategy is to immerse myself completely in the thing that I most love at the time um, and, and always prioritize. So if you've got a bunch of things that you love, you need to prioritize them because you can't do them all. Um, you can try, but it's not going to work. One of them is going to get more attention. So if I want to become the best skateboarder in the world, I'm going to change all my training 
training from, uh, you know, weightlifting or anything else or martial arts, because, you know, if I want to be good at martial arts and good at skateboarding, I'm going to get a little bit better at both. So prioritizing, um, you know, obviously scheduling is important, but I, f I feel like for me, it's been very adaptive because I've, I've, I've been very nomadic most of my life. Right. And so that's my main thing is to try, try to set it up now for the people who live a, what I'd say a regular life. You got a nine to five, you're a little bit situated. First thing is figure out what you want to get better at, what you love most, what you want to learn. Um, put that stuff into your calendar and then start doing it. And then look at how you can simplify your life so you can do more of what you want. Like, a, like what is the thing that you would do if you were retired? What would you do if you had a million dollars a day every single day? Um, what would you do? If you're doing that thing, you're aligned and you're, and you're on track. If you're not, you, you can build a bridge to get to that space, but you won't build it if you don't consider it, you don't think about it, you don't align it, and you don't work towards it. And that's all you have to do, but it might happen over a year or over two years. And so, you know, the balance is going to come from, you know, whatever's going on in your life. You might have kids that pop out. You might have uh, bills. Live simply, diminish, like really limit your costs, figure out what's most important and, and create a lifestyle designed around those things. And then you're going to be able to plan and put all those things in there, you know? So whether it's the yeah. course, right, you're going to, you're going to prioritize that. Um, so yeah, so it's individual, I think. Well, definitely, for sure. And you mentioned prioritization and adapting. And it made me think of like the difference between like specialist mindset and polymath mindset is the opportunity cost and how we might view opportunity cost. Specialists will think, okay, if I scatter my attention at all, if I don't just focus on one thing, then I'm going to have a lot of opportunity costs and that one thing's not going to be as good. Whereas the polymath polymathic person would be more like, okay, I can do this one thing. I can, like you said, I'm going to focus on this one thing that makes me the happiest, but I'm going to dabble in some of the other ones as well. And over time, those things will start to compound interest. Even if you're only doing one or 2% a week on that one thing, it's still going to still get a build up over time. Whereas that big main focus thing that you're doing, the main focus, like for example, late last year, not like middle of last year. is when I started doing the interviews, I had the show beforehand, but they were all solo. And I thought, okay, I want to do these interviews. And I started focusing purely on doing them. And I actually put aside my main series to do it. And so the main series had kind of suffered from it. But these, I was more passionate and more excited for these interviews. And obviously now I'm talking to you and <laughs> kept going. But it's one of those things where I still kind of kept the other things on the side burner and kept things going at least a little bit over time. Yeah, exa exactly, right? So you follow the inspiration and passion. So you're still podcasting. So you're still in that realm. You've just changed the form a little bit, looking at what the highest inspiration is, right? And then it might adapt into something else in the future. And so I feel like that's what we're doing, right? Because you can't create you know, solo shows at the same speed you can interviews, right? And so you, then you just look at that and you contemplate it and then say, okay, you know what? This is my highest interest right now. And then you put that to the top. So you're still in the realms, right? And as long as we're in the categories of our inspiration, we're going to be fine, right? And then and yeah. then following our, uh, you know, emotional pull, what are we most excited about? And when we when we think about what we're most excited about, that's, I think, when we're when we're honoring ourselves as creators and we're also giving the most to the environment, Right, because I like to say the creator, God, the universe wants you to be who you want to be. So if you're a beaver pretending to be an eagle, you're going to be a terrible eagle and you're going to hate your life or vice versa, right? So if the beaver decides, you know what, I'm going to be a beaver, everything in the environment will work better because he is being himself, right? And so we're all unique in that way. It's a bit of a ridiculous analogy, but you know, so often we're pretending to be something that we're not. And and if you're showing up at a nine to five job that you don't enjoy, um, yeah. It's not a life sentence. Do it for now. I worked in cars, you know, and when I worked in cars, I worked in cars for like six or no, eight months. And then that's how I afforded my big travel. I wasn't compromising who I was. I was working to get to my next level. And my boss said, you know, if he goes, because I had booked my travel to go to Nepal and in Thailand and in China and all those different places. And he goes, if I offered you 10,000 bucks, you know, to stay this month, uh, would you stay? And I was like, no, he's like, you're crazy. He goes, what about 20? And I was like, if you offered me 20, I'd stay for one more month. <laughs> you know what I mean? But then I'd be gone. You know what I mean? He's just like, well, and that's just because you can do more traveling after. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I calculated immediately like, well, one month. Yeah. Then I got 20 grand. I'm going to travel even more. So yes, then I would do it. Right. And so, but then even if you think about that micro decision, the decision is being based on my value. Right. 
I had the money that I needed to go. I knew the money I needed to make and I worked towards it. So when I came back from traveling, um, I was then broke because I spent it all. And then uh, they're like, hey, do you want to work in these cars again? So I saved up again, but I kept wanting to make online I got money online. I wanted to um, make money passively and I ended up getting a job from them uh, doing internet marketing for the car dealership that did not take a lot of time. And I traveled mm -hmm. another three, four years from that. It wasn't a lot of money. It was like 1500 bucks a month, but I kept it so simple and I was making a little bit of money on all these other things. So I probably fluctuate between 1500 and like three thousand dollars a month you know not much at all but just enough to travel to snowboard to be where i needed to be to live simply and that's that's how i had time to continue to educate myself to read the mm -hmm. books that i wanted to read right so you know i'll live in a small place and then i would read all the books that i wanted to read as i would do these different things right and so i'd keep it simple i'd be snowboarding i'd be traveling you know i spent the summer with the native american elder but i prioritized it you know what I mean? And so I feel like that's the important element. Well, and I think that's a good segue into the next question too, because you're taking a polymathic approach from what I can tell. And so something I ask all my guests is what is a polymath to you? Well, you know, how I remember it is my friend, uh, Robert Grant, I think he's a polymath. And I feel like it's somebody who is adept at various fields of knowledge, right? But, but not like, uh, not a beginner, right? So if you want to be a polymath, you, you need to be a master at it, right? So I feel like I would be pretty close at snowboarding and, you know, like, but I always compare myself to the best, right? I can't do a triple cork, but I can do a 720 over a 70 foot jump. So 90% of the people in the world can't do that, right? And then I go yeah. to, um, you know, weightlifting, you know, I'm not the strongest guy in the world, um, but I, I could deadlift 463 pounds at my max. And right now without training, probably somewhere around 400. Most people my size can't do that. And so I feel like a polymath is somebody who's able to achieve excellence in multiple categories. Um, and so, you know, and also too, if they're a true polymath, it always has something to do around something that they love. And usually there's some sort of artistic side in there. So for me, that might be snowboarding. But yeah, I think it's somebody who really pursues knowledge as well, you know, that they have that, that, uh, that inner drive, you know? Yeah. There definitely is an art to snowboarding, just like there's an art to swimming in my case, too. And I think that there's also the idea of, like, a different level to polymath. There's also some researchers who are trying to actually define what it means to be a polymath, and there's certain levels to it. And creative polymath is actually one of those aspects where some people who are more polymathic are actually creatives. They're just focusing on multiple kinds of creativity. But there's also a little bit more of the practical scientific polymath as well. And I think that there's also the idea of having an expert level versus master level. A master level is like the top five, maybe top 10%, whereas an expert may be top 70%, like the top 30, you mean. And it's one of those things too where I think you can be a polymath with just 70% of knowledge in four different areas, three different areas. And I think that for you, you have these snowboarding, you have content creation, you have these areas that you're very adept in that you could say expert in. And it's one of those things too where you can keep building. I know that we're both still quite young. We still have plenty of life ahead of us. By the time we're 80, we're definitely going to be polymaths just by pure happenstance in that case. 100%. Yeah. And if you look at any of the great uh, polymaths like Da Vinci, for example, almost all of them had some sort of artistic form. Right. There's artistic mm -hmm. and then mathematical. And that also shows the balance. Right. And so whatever we choose to pursue. Yeah. Give yourself a lifetime, you know, 10 years. If you go 10 years. Right. So you got 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70. You know, you choose seven different subjects or whatever that was, uh, you know, then you're good. Right. Then you have seven different mastery skills. You're adept at all of those. But it does take time. And that's why, you know, you could focus on, you know, doing a little bit here and there each time or then you can dive in. Right. But when I dive in, I'm never forgetting about my martial arts or my fitness because that's a way of being. That's a way of life. And I think an artist or a writer, they might get more passionate about inventions or whatever they're doing, but they wouldn't stop doing their art. They wouldn't stop, um, you know, creating in that way. And that's, that's the point too, right? Is you want to keep, mm -hmm. keep doing the things that you love to do and, and not just uh, completely forget them. Yeah, well, and not only that, it builds off of each other. So there's that trans contextual thinking where our swimming or snowboarding, the skills we know for that will translate to other areas. If I want to learn how to do something, I'll see how it translates to the skill that I already know and see if I can try to understand it through that lens. And that helps you learn that new skill quicker. And so too, when you start developing all these skills, it starts to compound like that. And it's interesting you mentioned that like every 10 years or so, 
I found that a lot of people who are like getting one career, they always said they can work for that one company. And so I'm a specialist, but you've worked four different careers inside that one company. You were entry level, you were middle level, you, you pivoted over. If you got promoted to C level even, those are four different careers with four different skill sets and four different ways of life, so to speak. So you're polymath by the end of your life anyways, because you've already worked all the separate aspects. And I think that's interesting too, that you quantified it into 10 years, because I think that is close to the idea of the 10,000 hour rule which it's not really a rule, it's more of a measurement, so to speak, because it could be eight or 12, depending on what the skill it is. But it is interesting nonetheless, so thank you. Yeah, no, no problem, man. <laughs> uh, what styles of Kung Fu did you train? So when you get to the uh, the academy, you have the choice. You can do Wing Chun, uh, you can do traditional Shaolin, you can do, or you can do Mantis. So I chose mm -hmm. Shaolin because um, I was interested in flexibility and snowboarding and the movements. Um, mm -hmm. and then, yeah. And so, and, uh, but I was curious about Wing Chun as well because of Bruce Lee. So I've trained a little bit in the past, but when I was there it was the Shaolin, it was really intense too. Like they would break it up in different days. It was, uh, nine, what was it like eight, eight, seven in the morning till four in the afternoon, Monday to Friday, no mm -hmm. breaks. They'd have power stretching where they would, you know, forcefully stretch you, uh, in a very bad way. Like, you know, I told them not to do that. I had to, cause they don't, do, they just do it their way that they know. And they're like reefing on you. You know what I mean? You have to go in the splits and you have a seafood just jamming you down. It's not good. People got oh. injured. Um, right. Cause yeah. that's just their type of training. You're signed up for their way. Right. So that was super intense. Then they would have power training where they would basically exhaust you. You know, it, you'd be so toast that um, you can only do 10 more, 10 more pushups and you end up doing 300 more. Like you were just, that's what they did. That's, that's, it was just the most ruthless physical trainers of all time. I remember like we would do at the end of the week, something called the mountain run. And you'd basically run, run up and down this mountain for an hour as many times as you could. I was going to ask. Yeah. So you go well, up, right? Oh, go ahead. I, like, I saw a video of them running up and then going down on all fours on the way down. Did yeah, you have to do yeah, that? Yeah. So, yeah. so, so I, the first time I did it, I ran it and then I saw somebody doing a bear crawl, uh, a bear crawl down. And so I was like, okay, cool. I'll do that. I'll go down on all fours. So I'm thinking there's just this top section, right. And I'm going to just do it down the first section. So I start doing it. Then unfortunately, a uh, Sifu comes by, he turns around. I'm right at this top section. I'm about to stop and stand up. And he just is standing with me and he makes me keep going and keep going and keep going. I basically, I'm like five times what I would have done. I am dying and I finally have to like drop. And then he just starts, he grabs a stick and he just starts hitting me with his stick. And so I end up, you know, keep going. I make it all the way to the bottom, which is probably 10 times the amount at least that I had considered doing because I was like, my brain didn't even go. There's no way. It's like, there's no way yeah. you can bear crawl all the, all the way down this. And so that's why their training is kind of amazing in that way. They're constantly uh, pushing you. And then they also had forms as well, which was amazing. Like these guys are true masters of what they can do. Um, there were, there were some weapons and they'd also do Sanda, which is Chinese uh, kickboxing. And um, I, I almost had an opportunity to go to a, a Sanda tournament. I think it was in Beijing, a really big one to represent mm -hmm. the academy, but no one else wanted to go. So I had been training with professional fighters. So I felt pretty confident at that time that I was like, yeah, I would go compete because they said that you'd make like, they're like, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And they're like, great. Like, we'll get your flight. And they're like, I was like, they're like, well, if you win, it's a thousand bucks. And if you lose, it's like 300. I was like, I don't care. I just want to go. That sounds awesome. And so it was supposed yeah. to be this huge stadium because uh, when I got there, I sparred with one of their better guys and, and was able to kind of, you know, beat them pretty easily. But I had just been trading, you know, six weeks with professional fighters. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so it's, it's a bit of a this. different thing. And I was mostly boxing, right? If it was a straight up, you know, by any means, if I was going up against a world champion, I get my butt kicked, but I could be competitive with people in the middle somewhere, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I love Kung Fu and I love Shaolin in particular when I've seen that. There was this, uh, Shaolin, I think it was Qigong, but it was a Shaolin training for push-ups, and he's sitting there in the horse stance and like this, and he's pushing out, and he's focusing on the push, and you do, you hold that stance for like a minute, and then you drop down and do 20 push-ups as fast as you can, powerfully, like as explosive as you can, then you repeat the process over and over again, you're pushing out, you come back, and you push out that way, and you probably had to do it a lot of times too, or something similar to it, but I saw that, and I tried it, and I as someone who's done push-ups all of my fitness life, and since that was one of the first things I ever did, 
I died in that workout. It was a five minute workout. That's all it was. And it's just because you're focusing your energy into those arms. You're focusing all, all that pressure out and you're getting the muscles primed up. It's, uh, oh, what is it called? Uh, dynamic strength, dynamic tension, where you're priming the muscles into it. And then when you do your actual exercise, it's much more explosive, I guess you could say, much more primed and ready. That's awesome. Ugh. Yeah. Well, they're, they're ruthless with no, with no equipment. They don't need any to be just totally ruthless. They got these simple things you'll do. that we like sit in a horse stance for like an hour. Like, oh man, <laughs> I want, right? yeah. you're, just, you're just dying. So they have many ways to torture you brutally with your own body. It's, it's quite fascinating. And I love the simple, the simple nature. And even just seeing you do that, it kind of reminds me of that. It's like, oh, connecting to the body. And that's similar to yoga and Kriya yoga, you know, just mm -hmm. really just tuning into the body. We're not, we're not, we're not doing that as a practice, you know, and it's a very mm -hmm. uh, useful and uh, helpful practice to do to just connect with your body and how it feels like I've been very fortunate in my life to have a healthy body. I've always trained and been athletic, but no, no big injuries. Like I broke a few limbs here and there, uh, but they healed up. Yeah. So people in pain, I'm like, you know, holy smokes, that, that get can't be comfortable. So figuring out a way to incorporate fitness into your life in a way that's fun. So for me, snow, snowboarding has always been fun. Skateboarding, now that I'm adult, I god it takes so much energy to skateboard you know just jumping up and down is, is insane and so just figure out something that you enjoy and you know take care of your body because you don't really want to be in pain and if if yoga is too serious if martial arts is too serious just find something fun because that way you're going to enjoy the practice and a lot of the that are skill based like martial arts it, it adds the mind element to it you want to get better you want to learn the technique and so yeah you know it's something important for people to consider if they're not into any of those um, practices yeah. So I got two more here that we'll probably have to wrap up pretty quickly, but I wanted to ask you, how can we truly master ourselves? Oh man, that's a really great question. So, well, it's, you're, you're always going to be unfinished. You know what I mean? Like there is no mastery at, in one sense. So like you think about Bruce Lee, did he master martial arts? Well, kind of, but not completely. He could always get better. Can you master skateboarding? Kind of like day one song and some of those other people, but you recognize there is no limit to mastery. So to master ourselves, I feel like is one, how we master ourselves is to be ruthlessly uh, to have ruthless spiritual integrity with ourselves. So to know who we are and to develop that and, and not compromise. Don't friggin' compromise and develop yourself in the way that you want to design. Shape your life, shape your 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 way of being, your experiences, everything. That that's how you do it because you don't know how long you have here. You might die tomorrow. So, you know, and, and anybody who's died, even like Da Vinci and all the greats, did they master themselves? No, but they accomplished a lot. They were everyone's in the pursuit of mastery or their highest potential. And so if we know if, if we are engaged in that, we are not compromising with who we are. That's it. We're making the choices, we're doing the things, we're we're taking that next step every day in pursuit of the highest integrity with our hearts and who we actually are. So if you don't know who that is, you better figure it out because there's no way you can master yourself if you don't know who you are. And you don't need to go do a specific breath work. You don't need to go train with the monks like I did. And that's why I did that stuff because I wanted that. And I learned that you actually don't need that. You can do it from anywhere. But for me and my path, that was my mastery because I wanted to do it. It was so exciting to me. It was, it was so do my, I. So I'm, right. Yeah. yeah so, you I know, I, you'll love it. It'll be amazing. It'll be transformative. And so that's it. Just be, um, really have full integrity with who you are. Don't sell your soul. And you, you continue that over a lifetime and you've, you've engaged in the path of mastery. If you sell out a little tiny bit and then a little tiny bit and a little tiny bit, you are just uh, selling out your own integrity. You're only, you're only damaging yourself. Well, you mentioned the compound effect before too, and that's a, that's a negative compound, so to speak, selling yep. out like that. And I love how I was able to learn a lot from you today too. It's one of those things that like, uh, for some reason I've always been fascinated by Buddhist temples, but also the Shaolin temples as well. And, and just understanding this, their philosophies and their ways of life. And so I'm glad I was able to talk to you about that. And so you just launched your coaching program, Atomic Alchemy. So what does that entail? Yeah. So, you know, in the past I was training pro athletes and then, um, over the last few years with the podcast, it was a lot of, uh, life coaching, I'd say, you know, performance coaching. And it would be weird because I would get, uh, people who are like CEOs and multimillionaires. You don't know how much money they have because they would, you know, be around the peak performance side and the mindset and the visionary kind of stuff that I do. But then I get a mm -hmm. lot of people who are like, Hey Matt, I want to live my life purpose, but I don't know how, you know, and, 
so many guests on my podcast have come on and we've discussed that in depth. And for me, I've always been asking that question of myself. What is my life purpose? How do I live it? What's most important? And for me, it's actually not that complicated a process. You know, um, it's quite easy. Um, you want it, it's a direction though. It's not an end result. So if you're a, if you're a boat on a sea, right? You don't know where, most people are just going with the current. That's the mainstream current that's designed for you. Whatever is, you know, normal in your, you know, wherever your community is, whatever those normal jobs are to make a living, it's all designed for you. You're in the current. Well, you can choose to create your life on purpose. Then you, figure out what your curiosities are, what your values are, what you would do if you couldn't fail, what's most important to you. You go through, it's a very simple checklist. I can, you know, help people know what that direction is in a very short period of time. Um, and so it's interesting because once they do that, then they have to engage in the process. And that's where the mm -hmm. challenge comes in because it's great to have this amazing vision. You might want to do, you might want to write a book. That's a big pain in the butt. You might want to start a podcast. That's a big pain in the butt, right? So yeah. you're going to have to put all those all that work in. Right. And so the reason why I started the group was I wanted people who were committed to living their life purpose. They wanted, want to give back to the community. Um, and they also want to be supportive. So I designed it like a dojo. So I still do some one-on-one -on -one coaching, but, um, the group, because I'm getting way, a lot of people reach out and it's an easier way to go through the training. But then, you know, when you go, you've been a martial artist, you know, this, in the dojo, then you go practice throughout the week. You got to go do that. So when you come back to the group, you're doing better. You have all the things that you need, right, to train during the week. But then you come back and you've got the supportive community. So um, it's been going really well and I love it. And, you know, we've had great people in there. And so the whole point is living our life purpose, making a positive impact, but engaging in different tools of spiritual, mental, physical, emotional growth, right? So some people are breathwork instructors in there. Uh, some of them are entrepreneurs. One person owns a, a hot spring RV resort and wants to make it uh you know some people are wants to make it into like some sort of retreat center and have multiple ones um some people are writing books right but everybody has to walk their own path so when mm -hmm. we know the sequence and the direction and then we have our uh community supporting us because nine times out of ten people don't have anyone who will listen to them right they always think you're a nut you know i want to i want to follow my dreams They're like you're not going to make any money of that don't do that right nobody yeah. nobody has that community and it's so important to have and it's really transformational and so the other thing that i created i think you're you know was the quantum heart hypnosis which is so simple because you know, hypnosis is just guided meditation. And I had one friend that's so analytical. I always ask if you had a million dollars every single day for the rest of your life, what would you do? He's so analytical, his brain can't process that question. Or if I said, if you could have anything, what would you want? He'd say $10,000 more savings, something, something crazy like that. So I said, okay, well, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna relax you, I'm gonna do a guided meditation. And all I did is do a guided meditation in his heart. And then what happened was he started crying in the middle of it. And it was a very profound experience. And so I was like, holy smokes, like I, I've done past life regressions. I studied meditations, hypnosis, all, all the different things. I, I get into it. And I was like, there's nothing like this. And all it is is that our mind is designed to keep us safe. So when we cross the street, we look both ways. Um, so in this reality, we need to eat. For us to eat, we need the coupons called money, right? And so if I ask you that question, what would you do if you could do anything? Um, if you can't figure out, if your brain can't figure out how to make money, it's going to distort the answer right? Because it doesn't want you to die. <laughs> so yeah. it's being nice, but your heart knows you're eternal. So when I ask you the exact same questions from your heart as the lens filter, your heart will give you the honest, direct answer. And so that's what's happening here is we're putting our minds over our hearts or who we truly are. And then the mind is supposed to figure that out. It's supposed to navigate. It's supposed to use all those analytical things, all those problem solving skills, sequences, the plans, right? But it's, but the heart is steering you in the direction, right? If you shut off the heart and you only go to the mind because it's logically safe, you're being manipulated by some other force and you're not creating and using your God-given, creator-given will or divine spark or who you came here to be. And that's why it's a, it's a beautiful and personal process because nobody can do it for you and everybody goes into the abyss and you have such immense respect for anyone else doing that. You know if they're in the yeah. abyss. Nobody gets a free pass. Everybody has to do the leap of faith no matter where they are because it's the, into the unknown, but it's a beautiful and uh, magnificent way to live. That's awesome. And I think that was a great way to end the episode as well. So like, there's a little bit of an outro here, but I think that's a perfect last question to ask. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for, for having me on the show. Thank you for what you're doing. Make sure you leave them a review. Podcasts are a ton of effort, so definitely support the show. Just uh, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it.
Thank you. So where can people find you online? Uh, go to mattbelair.com. Go over there because I'm in Telegram. But uh, start there because I'm <laughs> kind of got deleted everywhere. So that's yeah. the best spot. <laughs> well, hopefully things keep building back out. What would be like a call to growth for the audience to do today? The thing that I always share with my audience is uh, the best spiritual teaching I've ever heard. And I've had 450 mm-hmm. guests. I've been all over the world. I've done all the things you could do for a spiritual seeker to do. And the best one I've ever heard is from my friend, uh, David Lone Bear sent a pass. And he says to do three kind acts a day, go out of your way to do it and don't tell anyone. And uh, if we want to change the world, you know, meditation's good and all these other things are good. But if I could install one thing that would transform this planet as fast as possible is three kind acts a day, go out of your way to do it and don't tell anyone. I love that. And so I'll have links down below for people to see all the different various platforms that I have for you here. So once again, this is Dustin Mellon, Poly Innovator, and Matthew Belair on the Polymath Podcast. Thank you so much, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. See you guys. 